morning, everyone. Can you believe it's the last week of August? My goodness. I've started my Christmas shopping already, so I hope I've got my box set. Uh, welcome to Northport Community United Church of Christ, where no matter who you are or where you are on life's journey, you are always welcome here. And Pastor has an announcement or two. Yes. Morning. So there are a couple of things I would like to share with you. One is that we designated the first Sunday uh, of uh, the month of October as Substance Abuse Prevention Sunday. And we're going to have somebody who's going to share a testimony about their work at a hospital, what it was like. And um, so I think it's, a, it's an important thing to talk about in the church. And then the second thing is the first Sunday in uh, November, we're going to designate as Green Sunday. We're going to ask everybody to wear green that Sunday. And uh, it's in line with our denomination's, um, you know, uh, project, if I want to call it that. Um, it's called Creation Justice. And we're looking for individuals to share testimonies that are really just like 60 seconds long, one minute, uh, where you share with, with us how you are making a difference in this world by um, you know, being careful, uh, being a good steward of the environment. What are some of the things that you do at home to recycle, um, to not waste energy, but to save energy and those kind of things. So what do you think? Green? Yeah. Wear green and share something with us. And then we're probably going to have somewhere a place where if you bring something, then we can display that and all we need you to do is come forward and say this is what I do at home uh, to make a difference in creation today. And um, we will also have free gifts to give away that Sunday. <laughs> now not everybody is going to get one, but uh, there's going to be a system where we're going to give, um, I don't know, maybe a half a dozen gifts or so away and that has to do with creation justice. Thank you. Thank you. Food drive tomorrow, 10 a.m. to noon. The list of items is in your bulletin. Grief support group will meet Wednesday morning at 10 a.m. Men's breakfast will be Thursday at Perkins. Not Alvaro's, but Perkins. At the end of each pew is the red attendance book. Please sign your name, pass it down the pew, and return it to the aisle end of the pew. Today's flowers are given by Paul and Terry Hong in celebration of their son Chris's birthday. Join us for our fellowship hour following worship today. Invite somebody to join you. Barb Wager has the bags for the walkers today. I confirmed. If you're interested, see her and also see the article in today's bulletin. Tickets will be on sale following worship for the old fashioned pot roast dinner and movie this Friday, September 2nd. So get your tickets, please. Your, see your bulletin for more information. Thursday is the deadline to sign up for the fifth annual Faith Builders Retreat, January 26th through 28th, 2023. If you haven't called the church office yet, make sure you do it this week. And Allison has an announcement. Good morning. Good morning. I have little helpers that are going to help us remember some important information. So, on October 8th, which is a Saturday at 3.30 in the afternoon, we are going to be holding our first and hopefully maybe annual variety show, talent show here at the church. And girls, do you remember how much tickets are worth? Five. Five dollars. We have some art that's going to be on display. We have some musical performances. We have some gymnastics and skits humorous readings, balloon animals, and much more. Um, all proceeds are going to be going to help with the general fund, and we hope that you'll be able to um, support our church. And remember, it's October 8th at 3.30, and tickets are how much? Five dollars. Five. $5. So see us after church for your tickets. Thank you. Thank you. And we have a book, Your Battles Belong to the Lord, Know Your Enemy, and Be More Than a Conqueror by Joyce Meyer. It is in the library. 
A reminder, if you have a cell phone, we ask that you please turn it off or turn it on silent. And do we have any first time visitors today? Okay, let us be in worship. Good morning. good morning. It's good to see you here today in the house of the Lord. And if you open your bulletin, you will see a scripture all the way on top. Every week we choose one. And uh, this week it's from Isaiah 51, verse 1, 4, and 6. Listen to me, all who hope for deliverance. All who seek the Lord, consider the rock from which you were cut, the quarry from which you were mined. Listen to me, my people. Hear me, Israel, for my law will be proclaimed and my justice will become a light to the nations. Lift up your eyes to the heavens, which is not an unusual image in the Bible where it says to lift up our countenance or to lift up our eyes to him where our help truly comes from. Let us stand and sing our opening hymn this morning, which is 257, Oh, how he loves you and me. Join me in the responsive reading. This invitation is open to all. Come, taste, and see that the Lord is good. 
O Lord, God of our fathers, are you not the God who is in heaven and who has made all of creation? With your right hand and a gracious heart, you rule over all the kingdoms of this world. Power and might are in your hands, and no one can stand against you. You are the Lord, the God of all mankind. Is anything too hard for you? I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell you all your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. I will worship the Lord at all times. The love I have for him will always be on my lips. My soul will boast about the Lord's goodness and love. Let those who are brokenhearted and weary hear and rejoice. This is invitation is for you. Come taste and see that the Lord is good. Over and over I have sought the Lord, and he answered me. He delivered me from all my fears. Those who look to him have found joy, and their faces are never again covered with shame. I was once the broken and lost. Through bitter tears I called on him. The Lord heard me. He saved me out from all my troubles. I will praise you, O Lord, with all my heart. I will tell all of your wonders. I will be glad and rejoice in you. I will sing praise to your name, O Most High. The angel of the Lord encamps around those who honor him, and he delivers them. Blessed is the man who runs to God and takes refuge in him. Glorify the Lord with me. Let us exalt his name together. Praise his name. Sing joyfully for his redeeming love. Worship the creator of the universe and the lover of your soul. The invitation is open to all. Come, taste and see that the Lord is good. Good morning. How is everybody today? Everybody good? Did everybody start school this week or a couple weeks ago? Uh huh. How's it going? Are you having a good time? Yes. What are you learning? I'm learning like um I'm adding like I'm learning um like um standard form and uh -huh. um expanded form. There you go. You're doing them both then, aren't you? Uh-huh. Mia Rose, how's kindergarten? Good. Good? Do you like it? Uh-huh. What's your teacher's name? Miss Collins. Miss Collins. Do you like her? Uh-huh. You know what? She told me secretly that she really likes you, too. What? I know! <laughs> How is it for you? Good. Good. Or what are you learning? Learning how to read. How to read. Well, Eileen, that's pretty cool because once you learn how to read, you're going to learn all about this world and all the greatness that there is. Alton, what about you? What's going on in school this year? Are you at a new school or are you at the same school? Uh, same school as last year, but I'm learning a lot of new things. Well, then that's good. What grade are you in again? I'm in seventh. Seventh grade. You're really growing up on us, aren't you? And young man, what is your name again? Aiden. Aiden, are you in school yet? I go to school in Canada. You go to school in Canada. So you haven't started because you're still here in the U.S., correct? Do you enjoy school? Yeah. Well, that's a good thing. 
Well, I'll bet when you guys all started school this year, and Aiden, when you begin to, one of the first things that a teacher does is that they are going to give you some type of quiz or a test to find how far you've advanced so they know where to begin teaching you from that point on. Does everybody, anybody have to have that done? Did you take any kind of quiz or a test? Amelia? I took a spelling test for my spelling word. Well, very good. Did you get 100 on it? I don't know yet. Oh, well, we're going to have to find out what that answer is, aren't we? Well, I'll tell you what. I know you're not in the Sunday school right now, but I'm sure that's going to begin one time. Oh, excuse me. What is that, Mia Rose? Um, I really like, I learned about counting to 100. Wow, that is really cool. Can you count it backwards? No. No, I'll bet you will sometime, though. I promise you. Because you're going to sing about, oh, I hate to say this, 100 uh, bottles can, of beer on the wall. I can, but I can count backwards from 20 to 1. Wow, so you're getting there, aren't you? Uh-huh. Yeah, we only have 80 more numbers to go, don't we? What? Yeah, I know. Well, kids, when you get back into Sunday school, they're going to probably give you a little test there to find out just how much you know about the Bible, and they're going to know where to begin in learning the Bible and all of the parables and the stories that Jesus teaches us. But I think we ought to have a little test today. Do you guys agree? You're in for a test today? Yeah, I thought you'd get all excited. All right, here's your first question. Don't yell out loud. Raise your hand if you know the answer, okay? How many of each animal did Moses take on the ark? Two. Two. Um, 100. 100. Anybody else know? Anybody got a guess? So, Alton, you say it's two, right? Everybody else agree with two? You're all wrong! Moses was not on the ark, Noah was. Gotcha, didn't I? It was Noah that took all of the animals on the ark. Okay, here's another question for you. Can you tell me, can you find in the Bible anything they talk about the automobiles? Are automobiles in the Bible? No. No? No. 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 Does everybody agree it's no? I'm not hearing anything. You know what? You're all wrong. I know, because I'm going to tell you something. In Acts 2.1, it says, When the day of Pentecost was come, they were all in one accord. Everybody get it? Do you guys get it? A Honda Accord is an automobile. And it didn't say Honda. They just said they were all in one Accord. I enjoy having fun with you guys. But now we've got to get really serious. And I am not going to fool you anymore. I'm going to tell you the truth. But you have to know if you have the answer too, Okay. According to the Bible, one can one plus one ever equal three? Four. Four. You going to answer me? I don't think so. You don't think so. Anybody else? You're wrong. I know. Because you know why you're wrong? Because in Matthew it tells us, for where two or three come together in my name, there am I with them. So you see, every time two or more people gather together in Jesus' name, he's there with you too. So one thing that we do every Sunday here is we take account of how many people have come to church this Sunday. I'm sorry, my mouth is very dry. And I'm going to tell you right now that whatever that number was today, 
it's one more because Jesus is here with us too. Let's bow our heads and pray. Dear Jesus, we thank you for being here with us. And as we gather together to worship in your name. And all God's people said, Amen. Thank you for your time today. Get my foot out of there. Where is it? I can't find my foot, guys. Where'd it go? Oh, I can't. Oh, no. Here it is. Here it is. Come on, the other one's stuck. When she was talking about the accord, I thought you were going to say chariots of fire. Um, because there are chariots mentioned in the Bible numerous times. So um, let's give her a hand. That was great. And then today we're celebrating birthdays. I only have one person on, uh, for birthdays, and that's Elida Carpenter. And that's on my list, and that's on Wednesday. Where is Elida? Right there, happy birthday to you, and uh, good health, prosperity, and uh, wonderful experiences with Jesus in this next, next year. And you are getting a crown. So everybody turn around, wave at Elida, and say, happy birthday, Elida. Very good. Um, is there anybody who is celebrating a birthday or an anniversary that is for some reason not on my list but should be? Okay. Well, if not, then let's sing Happy Birthday, Elida. Happy birthday. That's great. So then, uh, prayer concerns. I just want you to know that so many of you turned in that prayer sheet this past month uh, with many different prayer requests that are coming up. And before we uh, go through the prayer concerns that are going to scroll through this uh, screen, I would like to share something with you that I heard yesterday that truly blessed me. I believe that everybody here has some sort of prayer list at home where you have the name of your loved one and maybe the prayer that you are saying for them and maybe have said for many years. Um, but at this service yesterday, somebody said that um, this individual, um, as they were in hospice, uh, the people that were surrounding him every day and being there with him, reading and singing together and um, just holding his hand, maybe uh, placing their hand on his forehead and praying for him, they said that one thing that made such a difference in that situation in hospice was that they felt the prayers of so many people hover over that room. And I was trying to picture that, what that's like. You know, when you are in a situation of need, maybe you're a long-term caregiver. You're um, having somebody at your home who has been bedridden for many years. These things, you know, they uh, take a lot of commitment on your side and uh, you need strength every day. May you know that there are many in our congregation that are part of um, um, praying, praying for you, praying for one another, and that these prayers are hovering over that place where you are at. And as the name scrolls through, we are also remembering in our prayers this morning, George Hamilton. He has some um, health concerns, and um, so we're lifting up George Hamilton who um, lives in another state now, but um, if he's watching us, George, um, we are lifting you up in prayer. And that's what prayer is, truly. Uh, when you are maybe not able to stand up on your own, and that might be physical or that might be emotional, lifting somebody up in prayers, you're doing it for them. You're lifting them up. Just as much as I would lift up a bottle um, before I drink from it, um, you're lifting up the need of your brother or sister your neighbor, your friend, your relative, your husband, your children or grandchildren. And um, we uh, are blessed and privileged to do that as these names scroll through and then I will lead us in prayer.
played. Oh, unto the hills do I lift up my longing eyes. Oh, that was beautiful. Do you mind playing that again for us? No, wait a minute. I, just, I don't remember where it was. I just closed the book. Sorry to mess up your plan. Uh, here it is. Okay, yeah, I can play it again. Let's close our eyes and just uh, imagine that. We're lifting up our eyes longingly to the hills where our help comes from. Lord God, on this Sunday morning, we're so thankful that we don't have to climb up a mountain, but you have come down to our valley. You have come down to seek us out, and you've done it with wholeheartedness, with total dedication. You have given your life for us. We have that image where we look at you carrying the cross, but it's truly not the cross that you carried, but our own sins. We thank you that you're calling us into your presence this morning um, through music, through worship, through singing, through prayer. And we thank you, Lord, that uh, our prayers aren't uh, said in vain, but um, you hear them. Even if we don't use any words, um, our hearts are open before you. They unfold. Uh, everything is bare before you, Lord. Uh, we pray for those who have lost loved ones. We have seen numerous names uh, on the screen. We pray that you help them to get through this experience and that you stand by their side and let them feel um, your presence, and not just um, day after day, but if necessary, moment by moment. Uh, we pray that you place your healing hand upon those um, who look to you for their healing. Uh, we pray, Lord, that you um, mend the brokenhearted and that you be with those that are lonely. Uh, we are in your house here today, and many of us have brought unspoken requests, and we're thankful that um, you know about those as well. So we place them before you. One by one, uh, we pull them out of the pockets of our hearts, Lord, and place them before your throne of grace. And we ask you that you would um, create a miracle where miracles are needed. Um, but the greatest miracle, Lord, is when you step uh, near to us and when you speak to us so that we can actually understand it. So we open up, Lord, and we say, please have your way and um, lead us in this service today. In Jesus' name we pray these things. Amen. We hear the choir.
Part of our service uh, is worshiping God through our tithes and offerings, and it's precisely for this um, deep, deep love of Jesus um, that cannot be measured. If it could be measured, it wouldn't be a divine love. It would be human at best, um, but it cannot be measured, and therefore we, um, we show gratitude, gratitude with our lives and the way how we serve Him. We bring our tithes and offerings. Thank you that we can serve you today in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's remain standing, and we're going to try something new today, and I take full responsibility. You can walk to the other end of the sanctuary and greet someone today, okay? Just walk somewhere and uh, say hi. I'm so glad you're here. Good to see you. Good to see you. Yes, so glad you're here. Are you okay with the... Do you need some water? Okay. Right, I'm glad you're here. Well done, well done. You look very nice. You're welcome.
so is Tony. That's right, that's right. All right. So, can I have your cane for a second? Okay. All right, so we may be seated. Um, anyway, um, did you have fun? Yes. All right, well, I'm so glad we did that today, and uh, I think it could go on for a long time, but I did ask Corinne to give me her a cane, and that means back to order. <laughs> so it's, it's fun to connect, and it's fun to have little conversations, recruit people for the choir, and those kind of things. So, um, we're looking at Matthew 4, and I'm reading for us 21 through 25, and um, it's basically uh, the last two verses of last week, and then we're going on and reading a few additional verses. And going on from there, he saw two other brothers, Jacob, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother, in a boat with Zebedee, their father, mending their nets, and he called them. They immediately left the boat and their father and followed him. Um, Jesus went throughout all Galilee, teaching in their synagogues, preaching the good news of the kingdom and healing all kinds of sickness and all sorts of diseases among the people. His fame went throughout all Syria and they brought to him all sick people who were taken with various diseases and tormented with pain, those who were possessed uh, with demons, those who had seizures and those who had paralysis, and he healed them. Great crowds followed him from Galilee, the Decapolis, Jerusalem, Judea, and from beyond the Jordan. So far, God's word. Let's turn to him and pray together. Lord God, we thank you that you enable us to see in your word what we might not see at first glance. Uh, we have had all different experiences this past week. Uh, you know uh, what that experience was like uh, for each and every one of us. And thank you for the many encounters that we had with one another, where we could listen to one another, where we could hear each other's encouraging stories about how you have carried and that you are carrying us. Um, you are lifting us up, Lord, um, to a level that we could never be able to be on our own. But it is your Holy Spirit and that is that heavenly physician working on the inside of our hearts and minds this morning. Please help us to release anything that disturbs us, distracts us, and maybe even discourages us and help us to hold on to all of your promises. You see your people here this morning. I pray that you please go from pew to pew, from sit, seat to seat, and touch lives as needed. You know what each and every one is looking for. In the name of Jesus, we pray these things. Amen. So if you were here last week, you will remember how we examined uh, Peter and Andrew 
um, how they left their jobs and began to follow Jesus full time. This was not a call to salvation, but it was a call to follow Jesus through service. Uh, and we said that really every believer is to reflect on this call because, or to, I shouldn't just say reflect, really also to respond to this call themselves. Um, and it's regardless of our occupation. Uh, you might not have to give up your secular job uh, to serve Jesus effectively, but I think he wants to use you as a vessel and he wants you to be in his ministry. Maybe not full-time ministry in the sense of, um, you know, being a pastor or uh, being a missionary or being an evangelist. Maybe not like that. But I do believe that each of us, no matter where we are placed, um, he is giving us a task. And this task is twofold. You're to be, you're to be the salt of the, of the earth and the light of the world. Um, you're supposed to be like, our lives are supposed to be like a sign um, that points us into the direction of Jesus. Somebody uh, a few weeks ago was sharing the story with me how they had gone to a doctor and the doctor asked them, and the person might be actually here in the sanctuary, I don't know this for sure, but the doctor said, can I pray with you? All right, before they did the test or before they did the surgery or before they did the consultation. You know, isn't that amazing? How wonderful, how assuring for that, um, for that patient. I remember um, Cindy Collins, she used to be in our choir, uh, telling us one time how she had been at a rehab facility in Venice and how the nurse, as they were going around with their cart, um, you know, dispensing the medicines at the end of the day maybe, uh, walked up with that little plastic uh, cup that had all the medicines in there and the nurse, too, looked at Cindy and said, can I pray with you before you take this medicine? So here's a nurse, there's a doctor, but you might be working in a store like Bruce does, or uh, you might be selling women's clothing like somebody else does in our, in our place here. I don't know what your assignment is, what God has given you, um, but I do believe that God is looking for people at the workplace who are individuals that reflect Christ and that are a witness to him. And I said this here before that it doesn't, it's not necessary that you force the gospel on anyone, but I do think that in every job and in every occupation, a time and a moment and a season arises in a, other person's, in a co-worker's life when they are open they know about you going to church. They know about you reading the Word of God. They know about you trusting in a Savior. And then they might look to you and ask you and question you, um, how can I find um, help in this circumstance or in this situation? So not just for missionaries, not just for nuns, not just for evangelists, not just for youth workers that are sharing the gospel with the new generation, but for everyone. Or maybe you have opportunity to meet people regularly because you go to their home as a caregiver or you fix things for people. God is not sending you there by accident. God has placed you there with a purpose. And, you know, it's so interesting that some of the greatest revival moments in history have been led by lay individuals who never received an ounce of theological training, but they were on fire with the Holy Spirit. They had a love for God, and they had a dependency on God. Uh, we just came back from our prayer retreat, and... One of the things that um, we were talking about there is that it's always a matter of the heart. It's always a matter of the heart. It's always about what's going on on the inside of us. You know, sometimes we sit in church on Sunday mornings and we might compare our lives to someone who is sitting behind us or in front of us and we say, oh, I wish my life would be like theirs. And somebody in our class this morning said, yes, but we don't know what their lives are like, do we? You know, over the years I have seen elders in uh, my church overseas that, I, uh, that all of our youth admired, and we actually 
in a way, wrote him off and said, well, that's him. He always has his ducks in a row. His life is always perfect. He always is close to Jesus. He always knows how to quote the right scriptures. But I have some refreshing news for you. He is by your side, whether you know to quote the right scripture, whether you seem to have everything in order or not. He sees and he understands to the deepest level how dependent we truly are on him. This morning, as I uh, was reflecting um, on this message, I thought, what in the world is it that I could say this morning that would make a difference in someone's life? And I came up with zero. I said, there's truly nothing that I can say that would help you or get you, propel you along or make you grow in your faith. And that's good that way. You know why? Because it it needs a different foundation. This message, you know, when I typed it earlier this week and I keep going back and adding things to it, that's like, you know, all that scribble there. You know, I read through it and I go like, well, that could fit in there or this could fit in there. I came to realize there's truly nothing I can say, but I can tell you that everything is wrapped up in this name that it says Jesus. Jesus. It's all in there. He's the Savior of the world. He's the one who, beyond carrying the cross, carried our sins. And he is that heavenly physician. He is the one who is by your side when you are stressed throughout the week and you are tempted to, you know, uh, maybe yell at someone because they really made you mad. Or you are stressed because you haven't slept for several nights in a row and you are tired and you are irritated and edgy. Do you get that like that sometimes? You go like, don't talk to me. And then you go back and you say, now you can talk to me. You know, we get like that, but in all of that, Jesus is real. I mentioned to you last week that Jackie Pullinger, who was that missionary uh, to people uh, behind uh, the wall city in Hong Kong, you know, was an example of what it means to trust God with our lives, with these stressful moments. Maybe you look back at this past week and you said, oh, I was really stressed right there at that point in my life. At that hour, this past week, things weren't all that great. I was rushing and running and doing and trying. And sometimes, despite all our trying, we don't get anywhere. Have you been like that before? You know, you've given your all. You've tried it. And it just doesn't work. And in preparation for this prayer retreat, I asked a good friend to pray. And I, without knowing it, and I think all of us participating in it, as a matter of fact, you have given me the feedback already, we all felt that the Holy Spirit was hovering. The prayers of the people that we had asked to pray for this event, we could feel it, we could sense it. How many times have you had people pray for you and you knew it? They didn't call you and said, oh, by the way, brother or sister, I'm praying for you right now. Maybe they did, but maybe they didn't, but you felt it anyway. Felt like, oh, there's somebody praying for me. I can sense it right now. Because if somebody wasn't praying for me, I wouldn't have handled this situation as well as I did. You know, I don't talk about politics often. Actually, I don't think I talk about politics at all. Not from the pulpit, anyway. But I saw this clip about, well, I'm just going to say it, about the first lady, current first lady, going to an ice cream store in Connecticut. And there was a group of onlookers that were about as far away as Carol Perkins' car from here. And I couldn't hear what the person said to the first lady, but I knew it wasn't nice. No, actually, I shouldn't even say that. She had a smile on her face, and I couldn't tell what the person said. But they said something to her, and she turned towards them, gave them a smile, and said thank you, and walked into the ice cream store. Not till later in the report turned it out that the person said something extremely unkind about the current president. 
But I thought, boy, she sure handled that well. She, you know, despite of what our political convictions are, there is such a thing as treating people with respect, dignity, and love. You and I might be right about something, but that rightness does not justify using words that are unkind or hurt people on purpose. And, you know, I am absolutely amazed the way how she handled it, with a smile and even mustard to say the words, thank you. So I'm thankful for that person that prayed for our prayer retreat. I'm thank you. I thank you for praying for one another throughout the week. I was talking earlier about the prayer list. Patty put this, you know, uh, prayer request for George Hamilton on my desk and you know, when I see something like that, then I know I can share it with you and you can go home and you can remember George throughout the week. And I know our lists are getting longer and longer, so it seems. And I was watching because I, you know, sometimes when I talk about people in my messages, I go home and I do some more research and refresh my memory on those individuals' lives. And Jackie Pullinger was one of them. I started watching a documentary on her life and she says something amazing in there. Since we're talking about, come, follow me. You know, these disciples that are following Jesus, leaving everything behind, and just like that, going and following someone that they barely know. That sounds like us, doesn't it? You know, we follow Jesus, but I have to admit, sometimes I barely know him. Or I know so little of him. You know, and I've followed him for the last 30 years of my life, and I feel like, wow, Jesus, I didn't know you were like that. And I didn't know that about you but I'm so thankful that you're showing me more and more what you are like. So she says in this documentary an amazing statement. She says when she, when she landed in Hong Kong, she looked at the different streets in the neighborhood where God sent her to minister in this, in this slum of all slums, behind that, that, that um, wall city. And she said she looked down one street in that neighborhood or in that, in that community. One single street, like let's say this main aisle in our church. And she said, I looked at that and I thought to myself, Lord, where do I even begin? If I take my entire life and spend it on loving all the people on this one street alone, at the end I would still not be done. That's a statement, isn't it? You lived in Hong Kong at one time. What was the wall city like? Can you tell us a little bit? The wall city in Hong Kong. The wall city. It was there, right. Yeah, I mean, if you see images of that, the planes, they all had to fly over that wall city. A terrible place. It was a lawless place. And that's where this woman is called, and she is saying that if I look at just one street, and I would spend my entire life ministering to people just on that one street, I still wouldn't be done. I couldn't get it all done. So she felt her utter dependency and her need. You know, we have, we have individuals right now that are ministering the gospel in countries where it's illegal to share Jesus with other people, where it's dangerous. Years ago, I was somewhere in the Middle East, and I'm not going to say where or what city. And I remember this man sharing with me, he was part of a congregation of a, of a Moravian church. And he was sharing how his place to minister the gospel in his society, where it was more or less illegal to do that, uh, was to go to McDonald's. And, you know, he would have a cup of coffee or a breakfast or a meal. And then if somebody was there that he could share the gospel with, he would do it. And he would even share it with women in a Muslim society, which is a big no-no. And I said, well, how do you muster up the guts to do that? Aren't you afraid? And he said, the love for Jesus drives me more than my fear. Sometimes we're driven by our fear instead of our love uh, for people and trying to help them. As a matter of fact, we were sitting at a McDonald's one day and he had seen somebody who had ministered to before. He walked over there, gave them something to read and came back and we continued our conversation. I come from a part of the world that's called the Balkans. Have you ever heard of the Balkans? 
That part of the world was occupied by the Ottoman Empire for nearly five centuries. So you have Christianity mixed with uh, the influence of, um, of Islam. And today, if you go to a country like Bulgaria, for example, the entrances to the church, okay, so let's say this is a door. The entrances to the churches, I would need a door that's about like this high. The entrances to the churches are about this high. And you know why? Because when the Ottomans were occupying that part of the world, no, they tolerated Christianity. And they said no church could have a higher entrance than a Janissary on his horse. So it had to be underneath that. So if one of the soldiers of the Sultan was sitting on the horse, that was the measure how low the door of the church had to be. And to this day, you will find monasteries and churches that are still reflecting that oppression. You know, we need to pray for our brothers and sisters all over the world who are persecuted for their beliefs. And so, you know, Jesus and the 12 that he called into ministry were people just like you and me. As a matter of fact, there were two additional disciples in the text that I read to you earlier today. They were James, the son of Zebedee, and John, his brother. And their occupation, too, was that they were fishermen, and they were in friendship with Peter. His partners, James and John, the sons of Zebedee, were also amazed. Jesus replied to Simon, don't be afraid. From now on, you will be fishing for people. And I'm just going to leave it right at that today. That as we go out into the world, you might say, well, Pastor, I'm retired. We just buried a pastor in our congregation, in our denomination. I looked at his age. He was 65. You know, I thought, wow, he maybe was having plans to retire. I don't know what his plans were. But I tell you, it was amazing to see the impact of that congregation and the people they have reached. At the coffee hour, there were numerous homeless people that came to the reception. People who said, we were loved, we are loved in this church for who we are. Aren't you glad today that you are loved for who you are, not who you have to become in order to fit? Because how could we all fit into one mold that's created by a church? Jesus said, come to me all. He didn't say, all who are dressed well, all who have a good bank account, all who had a wonderful career, all who are even, you know, loving and patient. No, he said, come all. And it also says, no matter who you are on life's journey, you are welcome here. I don't know if Janice Gamage is here or not today, but she says, I love that banner in our church. I love it when it's right there at the entrance. I love it when it's right here. You know why? Because we connect with that. You know, that you didn't have to, yeah, sure, we all cleaned ourselves up and polished ourselves a little bit this morning. The guys did this, and the women did this, and we all did this, and then we showed up. But I look around and I see many different faces. I see many different walks of life. And so when we say, no matter who you are in life's journey, you are welcome here. I'm only going to say it if I actually mean it. I'm not going to waste my time saying it unless I truly mean it. And you know, to see a homeless person walk up at a reception and say, this church loved me for who I am. Do you know what they have? They have a Sunday service and they have a Thursday church. And Thursday church is all the people come to Thursday church who are not used to having church like we do. Because maybe they don't have the right clothes to wear. Or they couldn't take a shower that morning. There's Janice right there. Sorry, I don't know how I missed you. 
It's amazing, isn't it? What a statement to say, come to me all who are weary and heavy laden and I will give you rest. And he's done it. He's done it for all of us, otherwise we wouldn't be here today. And, you know, this whole thing about Jesus saying to them, come follow me, they get up and they do it. Well, we're challenged to do the same thing this week. Whether it's answering the phone at the church, whether it's me going to tomorrow to the, um, the gallery to preach the words of Jesus, no matter where we are, it never changes. So maybe when you go to McDonald's this week, you never know. Maybe there's a lonely person sitting by themselves having their lunch, and you could just say, well, do you mind if I sit with you? And they go like, who do you think you are? <laughs> it's amazing who you can meet at McDonald's. Let's stand and pray. Well, Heavenly Father, we pray for the Christians around the world to whom witnessing about you isn't quite as simple as it is for us. You came into this world and you taught, you preached, you healed, you listened, you formed friendships, and people just by looking at you knew that they could leave everything behind and just follow you. I pray especially for someone here today, Lord, who is overwhelmed by the responsibilities they have. I don't know who that is, but there's somebody here who feels it's just overwhelming me, all the things that I'm responsible for and that I must do, and I don't know how to do them. I pray that you step near to them, especially today, Lord, and help them with those responsibilities. Lift their burdens and lighten their hearts. And we thank you that you speak to us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. You may be seated. We're singing our closing hymn, To God Be the Glory. into, we look at Psalm 121. We will lift up our eyes to the hills. From where does our help come from? Our help comes from the Lord who made heaven and earth. Go in peace. Amen. Mm -hmm.